So I thought we'd take a little trip back in time today and instead of looking at the 90s, let's look at 1929. This is the Boston Advertiser Daily Record from February 15th, 1929. Two sides of the paper. Um, both sides are pretty bad news. Let's look at it in more detail. Uh, the weather, cloudy. Little change in temperature, shifting winds, light, all vehicles at 5.46 p.m. So that means turn on your headlights at 5.46. Um, it's the final edition. 52 Hurt and Big Blast, story on page 3. Flaming Blast Rex Street. Firemen poured huge amounts of chemicals into manholes at Summer and Art Streets after Roaring Blast and Belt Roaring Blast had belched forth among homegoing crowds. Police ambulances changed their way through packed streets and took 52 persons to hospitals. It's a pretty dramatic picture there. Some other pictures on the cover. Bared legs. Surgeons at the Haymarket Relief Hospital cut stockings from the legs of this unnamed girl when she was brought there for serious injuries received in the explosion. Photo shows her going home in a taxi cab. That's pretty harrowing. Lifted in the air um, by one of several explosions, Henry Simmons, fireman of Ladder 17, was tossed through the window on Summer Street, indicated by arrow. His rescue was impeded by billows of coal black smoke that filled the streets. And there's the arrow. Be thrifty. Boost your bank account. See page 2. Killing of seven laid to Compone gang. Uh, kidnap and torture leader. Okay, Chicago, February 14th. George Bugs Moran, leader of the vast Alki Syndicate, and another man not known or believed by the police to be kidnapped and now subjected to torture to wrest from them intimate secrets of gangland following the slaughter of seven of Moran's gang today by two carloads of killers who swooped down on their north side stronghold. Members of the old Scarface Al Capone gang, gang from the south side are credited by some of the police with being the murderers who carried out this wholesale execution, the most merciless and sensational in the bloody history of Chicago's underworld. True to gang's code, Frank Gutenberg, seventh victim of the devastating attack, died this afternoon from six bullet wounds. Holding to the true gangland code to the last, he refused to give the police any information. The victims of the attack were swept to a horrible death before an avalanche of machine gun, sawed-off shotgun, and revolver bullets. They were propped against the red brick wall of the warehouse and were shot down in their tracks, moaning, screaming, and cursing as the infernal whine of the roar of their leaden slugs mowed them down. One of the seven, Frank Gusenberg, lived for two hours. The battle happened so suddenly that before a police alarm could be given, the attackers leaped into their machines and sped away, leaving a tangled mess of bullet-riddled bodies, confusion, and chaos in their wake. Bombs hurled. Strewn among the bodies were the implements of death, machine guns, sawed-off shotguns, revolvers, and dynamite bombs, which had not exploded. The interior of the warehouse, used as a liquor headquarters and meeting place of the Northside gang, was wrecked as if a tornado had struck it. Wow. That's awful. I actually saw that wall. They they removed it and they've moved it to Las Vegas and you can see it there too in the mob museum. The actual wall was uh is transported there with the bullet holes intact and everything where they were all lined up against it. There's a lot of things in that mob museum. There's even the chair that Albert Anastasia was sitting in in the barber shop when he was executed. Um Slain gangsters were moved by police. There's a picture of um, the uh, bodies being put into a, a hearse or, or an ambulance. In the police inquiry that looms over Chicago's kingdom was taken when the bodies were removed for examination by high officials of the police department. 
Engineer killed, fireman died in Fall River crash. Fall River. William H. Gilman, engineer for the New Haven Road, was killed and his fireman, Joseph Mason, probably fatally scalded today when their switching engine sideswiped a Boston-bound freight in the New Haven yards here. Gilman received a fractured skull and, and was scalded by escaping steam. Mason is at the Fall River General Hospital. Neither engine was derailed. The last car on the freight, a tank car, into which the switcher plowed was upset. The force of the collision threw Gilman and Mason against the boiler and snapped off the steam gauge, giving full vent to the outpouring steam in which both men were enveloped. Not a lot of good news today. Fall River, isn't that where uh, Lizzie Borden lived? I think, it, I think that's the same place, Fall River, Massachusetts. Suicide Widow's Note Exonerates Rice and Slain. Willimanti, Connecticut, February 14th. While Trenner A. Rice, 37-year-old deputy sheriff, sat in the county jail in Brooklyn awaiting trial for the murder of County Detective William E. Jackson, a note left by Mrs. Gertrude Jackson, widow of the detective who yesterday committed suicide, exonerated him of the stigma today. Although its full contents were not made known by authorities, it was stated by medical examiner A. Mason that Mrs. Jackson wrote she was to blame for the killing of her husband and that Rice was innocent. Further questioning of Dr. Mason brought no additional comment. Rice, a pallbearer at the funeral of Detective Jackson and an intimate friend, was indicted by a special grand jury for the murder. He was not told today of the suicide of Mrs. Jackson and therefore does not know that she absolved him of the slain. Chicago grounds gather at the scene of the gang slain. There's the picture. You can see where it happened. Low building at the center of this Associated Press telephoto is the garage in which the gangsters were slain. Hundreds of persons remained at the scene until the police took away the bullet-riddled bodies. Wow, a lot of dark news. Advertiser adds $20 to bank books. Is your bank book number here? A bank account is your friend in need. Your um, This is basically an ad to set up a bank account, it looks like. Lots and lots of flowery language, Shakespeare, and interesting. Um, this was 1929, February, so the Great Depression had not started yet. And it's interesting that you would see something like this, though. Um, uh, within a year, people would be pulling their money out of the banks because the banks were failing. This is before the FDIC had uh, protected accounts. Originally it was like for 10000 then I think it's up to 100000 now. But um, people cleaned out their bank accounts and banks failed all over the country. This Christmas, if you sit down and watch It's a Wonderful Life, that, that plays into that story a lot. Um, 52 injured in blast stampede. Thousands flee as manhole covers blow off. Fleeing in mad panic when the explosions of 26 manholes shook Boston's shopping center like the blast of bombs. Two persons were seriously injured and 50 others hurt as terror-stricken thousands trampled each other yesterday afternoon. Men and women jammed in the rush. Our mob fell to left and right as if shot down by machine guns. Glass crashed from huge plate glass windows like shrapnel. Black smoke billowed over Summer Washington, Chauncey, Arch, and Bedford streets like a pall, a light here and there by flaming volcanoes when another manhole exploded. Bystanders believed that the end of the world had come as one thunderous roar followed another and mad panic reigned for blocks. At 5.15, the first manhole cover at Summer and Chauncey streets exploded and then flames shot up as from a volcano. Grinding roars, manholes blow up. An alarm was rung in. And as fire engines came screaming through rush hour traffic, more curious thousands were added to the jam of homegoing commuters. Hardly had firemen begun to pour fomite on the blaze when with a stunning succession of crashes and a grinding roar, other manholes exploded in a steady blast. Then panic reigned. Before 200 police reserves could reach the terror-stricken district, a thin line of blue coats battled to drive the crowd from the danger area. Do you notice how the language is in this paper? How it's almost kind of flowery? How it's the descriptions? This is not how. Um, I mean, this is a legitimate paper. Um, it's not like news stories today. Uh, it's interesting how it was written with a lot of drama, a lot of uh, visual um, the details in, in the wording. 
Here's a photograph. Police lines established to direct crowds. Flashes of light and the clang of ambulance bells attracted great crowds that were kept out of the danger zone by squads of policemen. Photo shows the police line at Sumter and Otis Streets. Picture that for a second. The ambulance doesn't have a siren but bells. You know, clanging bells. Here's a list of injured. Here is um, injured taken to Haymarket Relief Station. John Crowley left 72 Gore Street, Cambridge. Or Edwin Bloomstock, 221A School Street, Somerville, had their injured heads bandaged by doctors at Relief Station. Here's a list of injured. John Flaherty, Joseph Timmons, John Crowley, Miss Priscilla Conrad. And here's a map that shows the map of the blast area. The terror ruled streets, witnesses declared. So this was a pretty crazy explosion. Um, Feline's Automatic Bargain Basement. One sure way to put a stop to extravagant spending is to get acquainted with Feline's Basement where clothes cost less. Our famous automatic plan guarantees low prices or we lose through automatic reductions 25% after, after 12 selling days, 50% after 18 selling days, 75% after 24 selling days, goods unsold after 30 selling days given away to charitable institutions. Saturday, new lot like those that folks bought eagerly early last week in one of the season's most popular fabrics. Women's misses, new silk flat crepe dresses. That's a that was a popular style in the twenties. And look at the hats. See, that's the uh, the sort of flapper look. And this is the you know this is the last year of the twenties, but you sort of see it evolving into the nineteen thirties look too. This wasn't like, I, I would say more like 1923, 24. Uh, it was like the flapper time. Although it was still carried on. Um, some more how people dressed back then. And there's more about the shooting in Chicago. Blaming it on Capone. Uh, Healthiest girl student. What is this? Miss Doris Buell of Ferris Institute, Big Rapids, Michigan, who was awarded the title of the healthiest girl in Michigan, ranking first, also intelligence tests in a field of more than 800. That's nice. Prisoners try to, trying to escape dying blaze. Two unidentified prisoners were burned to death in the frame. Um, Chico Teague Island Jail, 35 miles south of here today. Screams called Bucket Squad. Mrs. John Ladd of Cliftondale was a direct actionist. When she looked from the window of her home on Elmwood Avenue yesterday and discovered a blaze in the barn of her next door neighbor, she ran to the porch of her home and screamed for help. Noted theatrical man killed by flu, um, Walter J. Kingsley. Uh, for many years, Mayor of Broadway died today in the New York hospital. He has been ill for several weeks with influenza on um, dyspinal meningitis for the past year. Kingsley's been uh, something advisor to Florence Ziegfeld of the Ziegfeld Follies. Um, that was a big deal in the 20s. Kane's 23rd, 23rd February sale, Friday and Saturday only. Some furniture sets here. 14 piece Persian mohair living room complete. Um, five piece breakfast set. Uh, majestic uh, radio right here. Listen to some jazz. Did you see how big that radio was? Victim aids and arrest of youths. Um, Bernard Kelly left and Walter McCurra at Superior Court after receiving prison sentences for looting the apartment of Miss Helen Daly of Dorchester, who trailed them and later had them arrested as they were leaving a streetcar. And they're both dressed kind of like gangsters, you know, with the hats and everything. Um, Mercury, to, Mercury to rise. Oh, slush says, weatherman. <laughs>
Gilchrist tailored crepe dresses. The crepe dresses were really fashionable then. And also this sort of like sailor tie sort of thing. And of course the hat was a, the, that style of hat was very, very popular. A special hot nut combination offer. Box of face powder and a bottled perfume. Three flowers perfume. Boy disappears on the way to school. Playful, playfulness might have blown up school. Um, police investigating an alleged attempt to blow up Parker Parker Avenue School said tonight they dropped their investigation as they found nothing to show criminal intent. John Connolly, the janitor, reported that when he went to the school building today, he found the safety valve tied down on the boiler. The water shut off and the drafts open. Miss Owl Wide Awake, Miss Abby Fleming of Pinecrest Avenue, Saugus, selected by the Lynn Lodge of Owls as Miss Owl at the St. Valentine's Day Dancing and Costume Party, which is to be an annual affair. Took bride under fear of his life, says boy husband. An 18-year-old boy battled for his matrimonial freedom in Middlesex Court yesterday while his pretty 17-year-old wife, a, pet a petite brunette with long, dark curls, fought bitterly to hold him to her side. The youthful husband, Edward R. Laura of Somerville, asked for an annulment. His little wife, Mary Christina Laura, is strenuously opposing his suit. Laura charges he was forced into marriage by fraud, duress, and coercion. He testified he met his wife two years ago when she was a little girl playing ball in the streets with another girl. He was attracted by her appearance, he said, and made a date to call on her at home. On the occasion of his first visit to the home, Laura testified the girl's father urged him to marry her and told him he would be given $1,000 on his wedding day and rent-free home for two years. The father added, according to Laura, that if the boy refused, he would be killed. Laura testified his life was threatened several times by Mary's father and that he finally married Mary because he was afraid of her father's rage. The young wife is expected to take the stand today. Here's uh, what other store gives you all these advantages. Um, Scott Furriers, and it's fur coats, not really in fashion these days, but it's just a good glimpse of how people dress back then. Furs we do not sell, because we cannot honestly recommend their wearing qualities. We do not sell squirrelettes, muskratines, cheap sea lines, pieced raccoons, calfskin coats, cheap kid caracoles, uh, leopardines and other inferior furs. I don't know if that's a joke or if that's real because I don't know anything about fur. Um, it almost sounds like they're squirrelettes. That almost sounds like a joke to me. Substantial savings today and tomorrow, First National. And let's take a look at going to the grocery store in 1929. Campbell's Soup, three cans for 25 cents. Shredded wheat, three packages for 29 cents. Ivory soap, two large bars for 23 cents. Del Monte pears, a large can for 25 cents. That's actually kind of pricey if you think about it. Um, flower sale, gold medal, Pillsbury's, kitchen tested, 98 cents for a pound. No, I take that back. 24 and a half pound bag for 98 cents. There you go. Because people did a lot more cooking back then. Finest pastry flour. Uh, 85 cents a uh, package of lard two pounds for 25 cents sugar was 10 pounds for 53 cents you know lard seems very strange today but I remember when it was widely used um, and I will say this that uh, a birthday cake frosting with made with lard tasted really good and as, as a little kid back in the old days that was just a better taste it may sound gross now but yeah, there was a time when that was widely used. As a matter of fact, for a long time, people thought Crisco was a healthy alternative. But actually, it's really the same thing because all they do is pump hydrogen into vegetable oil and it has the exact same effect as lard anyway. So it wasn't healthy. So for years and years and years, we had Crisco 
thinking it was a healthy alternative, but it's pretty much the exact same thing as lard. Um, sugar, bacon, machine sliced sugar cured bacon, 27 cents a pound. Uh, Lux soap, 21 cents. Ohio blue tip matches or federal, six boxes for 20 cents. Why it was matches laid out here with all these other things? Because that was a household commodity. You needed matches to light your stove. You needed match if you didn't have electricity, which many people didn't have. You needed matches to light light your lanterns. Uh, you needed matches to light your cigarettes because people smoked a lot, or they smoked pipes or cigars. Matches were much more widely used back then. Royal baking powder to make your biscuits, to make your dough rise without yeast. Hershey's cocoa. Red salmon, uh, that was a luxury food. Hecker, Hecker's cream farina, two packages for 25 cents. Uh, H&O quick oats, uh, oatmeal breakfast. Gorton's or Davis codfish cakes, that's just what you could buy today. You know, your baked fish. Okai cleans a million things. Two packages for 25 cents. Fleischmann's yeast for your health or for cooking. A lot of people uh, ate yeast for health, stomach issues and stuff. It tastes, tastes and smells terrible, but cats like it. Touraine chocolate nut bar, a luxury item. 25 cents. Finest pears, 25 cents. They served pears back then. When I was a little kid, pears were like a dinner item. I mean, my mom would put, you know, canned pear slice with um, a scoop of uh, mayonnaise and it would, and then shredded cheese and then a cherry on top. That was a, that was something I grew up on. Beef, rib roast, face rump, chuck roast, rump steak, porterhouse steak. These are really good prices compared to what beef is nowadays. Pork loins, shoulders, pork chops, sausage meat, hams. Uh, armor, star hands, brisket, lettuce, carrots, spinach, oranges. Not a lot of vegetables. It was harder to get vegetables. And then fish. Uh, more clothing ads. More of those uh, spring skirts. There are lots of pleats in the skirts. Um, Shanghai boy wires mall from train fare. Joseph E. Dwyer, missing Dorchester youth thought to have been shanghaied on a rum-running tug shanghaied on a tugboat, was located yesterday when he was telegraphed from Philadelphia asking his mother, Mrs. Joseph J. Dwyer, uh, for a train fare home. The telegram failed to state whether Dwyer, who is in the 20-year, who is the 21-year-old proprietor of a Roxbury battery station, had been taken to Philadelphia and released, or whether he'd made his way there himself. Uh, and he was running rum, which meant he was violating the Volstead Act. See, you didn't see in the grocery stores, you didn't see beer or any kind of wine or spirits because it was uh, illegal at this time. It had been illegal for 10 years at this point. Let's see. Morgan's, some furniture, bedroom sets. And this just gives you an idea of what uh, furniture looked like back then. Drops her plan to sue dad-in-law for a million. Mrs. Rollins also abandons fight against divorce. Mrs. Ashton Rollins, wife of the millionaire son of Edward R. Rollins, founder of the internationally known um, banking house, which bears his name, has abandoned her fight against divorce action and her intention of filing a $1 million alienation suit against Elder Rollins. It was announced here today. This is Gladys Ziegler. Ziegler. Um, Rose Gallagher. More furniture and radios. A pure cotton mattress. This is before all the mattresses and pillow tops and memory foam. They were all basically the same. They were either stuffed with cotton or stuffed with feathers. They had some kind of springs in them if they were nice. Gold medal flour, 98 cents for a 24 and a half pound bag. Who buys a 24 pound bag of flour now if they don't run a restaurant? When you go to the store, you usually don't buy more than a pound at a time because generally baking is now no longer a daily thing for people, but it's like a maybe something you do for the holidays or, you know, 
generally speaking, a pound of flour lasts families now maybe half a year. It's crazy how things have changed. Um, guns and dynamite in beggar's bag. This is, see, all the gangster stuff, all the gangster talk is because this was the gang wars times. This was the time of Al Capone and Lucky Luciano and Boardwalk Empire and all of that was happening because of Prohibition. And it made them so powerful that when Prohibition ended, they had enough money to diversify into other things like casinos and other crimes. Chesterfield cigarettes. Mildness without flatness. Mildness without taste. It's all in the blend and the blend. Mildness with taste. And the blend can't be copied. Chesterfield. Find ambitious cops didn't cheat in exams. Uh, mystery book is explained. All had to dig for tips. It's another app for A&P. Sliced bacon, 27 cents. Keep it a secret and then forget it. The coward's shoe. That's uh, for bunions. Uh, bunions are caused by uh, diet deficiencies, like too much uric acid. If you, um, if you have too much fat in your diet, you would get bunions. Some people didn't always have good diets back then. They don't always have good diets today. But, um, you know, like, that was a sign of, of, uh, of a poor diet. So, um... Mrs. Lindbergh's reported fiancé happily married. Evangeline Lindbergh, mother of, the, of Charles. Uh, at this time... Charles Lindbergh was a huge hero in America. I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but he was an aviator. Uh, he flew the Spirit of St. Louis airplane, uh, the transatlantic flight. It was uh, it, it was pretty amazing at the time for you know a prop job plane. Um, so Lindbergh at this time was considered a hero, and he was considered a hero until the beginning of World War II when he had uh, he he basically was an isolationist and didn't support um, fighting against the Nazis, among other things. Um, he lost a lot of favor. There's a mountain named after Lindbergh in Colorado. They renamed it because of that. And here's some just some a photo spread. With some great pictures from 1929. Holiday Merrymakers. Um... Dead Man Reappears. Henry J. Young, for years, engineer of the Belvedere Mills, Lau, who died three years ago, reappeared the other day in the form of an apparition on the wall. His friend declares, the mirage formed, a coal, formed in coal dust on the wall of the boiler room of the factory as shown above. So, interesting. What's the face? Thousands in panic in Summer Street Blast, and we, women trampled, women trampled, as 26 men all covers burst, so we talked about that, some more A&P ads, children's colds are best treated externally, um, that old remedy of rubbing Vicks all over a kid's chest, and then putting a t-shirt on them, and then letting them sleep it off to open up their sinuses, that was something I remember as a kid. There's another cure that goes way back. It's said that if you have pneumonia, now I've never tried this, but that if you uh, chop up a whole bunch of onions and cook them and then take a bath in that, it'll cure pneumonia. I don't know how true that is. Wow. Let's get to the entertainment section. Titled English actor, also a naval commander. What's shown at the movies? There's, um... Amusements, Van and Schenck, Nancy Carroll, and Sin Sister. Uh, RKO Hour. So yeah, this is a movie. Uh, Olympia Fenway, The Wolf of Wall Street, starred George Bancroft. The Vagabond King. The Outsider, Richard Dix in Redskin Throws for Eye and Ear. Um, the Barker, George Jessel, The War Song, 
he was really popular, George Jessel. Tomorrow, the howling, 100% talking, laugh, riot, the ghost talks. Um, with a great cast of speaking stars, because this was a talkie. Because silent movies were on the way out. And although this was the same year that It with Clara Bow came out, uh, talkies were coming in. It was a new thing. It was like Eddie Cantor singing his song from Whoopi. Uh, I mean, he, I don't know if you watch Boardwalk Empire, but Eddie Cantor is one of the characters on that show. Five Dollar Blotto is made by Schoolboy. Blottos, those were um, designs, ink designs, where you drop ink in a piece of paper, fold it, and make these Rorschach test looking things. Here's some comics. Tilly the Toiler. Gosh, that looks like that blue roadster I left the securities in. Did you wish to see me? Did you wish to see someone? I came to return these securities I found in my car. Oh, thanks a lot. I'll take him right into the boss and he'll give you the reward. Forget that. Meeting a nice girl like you is reward enough. Here's my card. Say, Mac, it sure was a lucky day for me when I lost those securities, huh? <laughs> you know, and look at how the characters look a little bit like Popeye. This is a beauty advice. Uh... Health tips, beach combing, still very modest bathing suits at this time. There's some poetry, Bible verses. Uh, no amount of croppers have been able to keep the Prince of Wales out of the saddle. And they're talking about who would become Edward VIII, uh, the temporary king of England before he abdicated. Sally of Show Alley by Homer King Gordon. It's a little story, a serial story. The Nebs, another comic. I'll read it. Gosh, I wish I could get off next week. Everybody's going to Sylvia's lawsuit. If you was dead and to get buried in the afternoon, you couldn't get the morning off here. Sylvia ain't such a nice girl. She thinks she's better than somebody else. She's always terrible, sarcastic to me. But anyhow, I want her to get some money from old Potts. But Sylvia never got no $100,000 worth of heartache. There ain't that much. Either way, the case goes, what are you going to get out of it? Neither one would get a dime to see you standing on your head. In front of the town hall, dismiss him from your mind and try to think of something that will get you something. Hmm. Uh, and here's the, like the... We get into more of the fringy part, like snake oil stuff. Remember when father would get a mustache cut for Christmas? Girls wore aprons to school. Some people wore red flannel chest protectors to prevent nosebleeds. The children used to try to pass the silver three-cent pieces as dimes. And those are little memories that people in 1929 who were old would remember. Minute movies, uh, love six suicides, not great lovers, but great fools, says Faye King. See how the comics are sort of spread out instead of on one page. Here's the uh, radio programs the news, morning watch, information service, the polar bears, Grant's magic buyers, national radio, homemaking, make homemakers club. Uh, news flashes, dandies of yesterday, U.S. civil service, health exercises. So they had exercise programs on Radio Household Institute, the Friendly Five, News Dispatches, Dutch Girls, Sundown, uh, Big Brother Club. Just uh, interesting. That was the radio schedule, and this was when radio was still pretty new. Uh, here's sports. Jack Shea breaks three mile record. Max Schmeling coyotes himself out of a job. The boxer Max Schmeling. He was the one who fought uh, Braddock in that movie Cinderella Man. 
cigarettes, lucky strike. Some more sports. Official American League schedule, baseball. Some more snake oil stuff, classifieds. And on the back we get a picture of very gruesome picture of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Not even really touched up. Just showing it in all its gory detail. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. A little trip back in the past. And um, that was 1929. And we saw a lot of stuff. We saw how groceries were priced. We read some comics. We read some news. We um, read some society stories. We uh, looked at clothing stores furniture stores it's just an interesting trip back in time and we even got a little hint of what the old people then remembered in that little section so i hope you enjoyed this so if you like my channel subscribe leave a comment uh, leave a like and uh, click the bell icon and until next time bye